Well, I'm thankful to have the opportunity to come here tonight and try to bring a lesson from God's Word. I trust that as we study that the things that, that we look at will, will have some meaning, that they will apply to your life. Um, the title of what we're going to talk about tonight is, is simply Heart Checkup. Uh, over the last couple of months, I've had the opportunity to spend a lot of time thinking about hearts, thinking about how they work and, and how things interact with them. And so I thought I would try to share some of those things with you from a spiritual purpose tonight. And again, I hope that you can understand the things that I'm trying to communicate because that's the whole point. If I don't make myself clear, if I create a question in your mind, please come up to me afterwards and let's clarify it and let's understand what the Bible says. You know, inside of our bodies, we have this muscle right in the middle of our chest. It's called the heart. And it is responsible for keeping our blood flowing through our bodies. It is what keeps us alive. And sometimes we don't take care of it the way that we should. Um, sometimes things can damage our heart. Sometimes it doesn't work like it should. And sometimes something is wrong with our physical heart, and even though something might be wrong, we may not be actually recognize it unless we're paying attention. But we have learned a lot about the heart. We know how to take care of it. We know how to repair a lot of damage if something happens to our heart. We know how to make it stronger. Because if your heart is bad, you can't do what you're supposed to be able to do. If your heart is bad, you can't operate the way you were designed. You are limited. Sometimes you're unable to do anything that your body was built to do. Well, if we talk about the Bible and how the Bible talks about the heart, the heart of the Bible is a little bit different. It's not talking about the muscle in our chest. When the Bible talks about our heart, it is talking about that part of us that is our spiritual center. It is talking about the part of us that understands good and bad and right from wrong, the part of us that is happy, that is sad, the part of us that makes us do mean things and thing, the part of us that makes us do kind things. That's the kind of heart that the Bible talks about. But, you know, just like our heart muscle, the heart of ours can keep us alive spiritually, or it can be damaged. And it can prevent us from fulfilling our spiritual function that God has put us here on the earth for, and ultimately it can prevent us from reaching our spiritual destination. Now, fortunately, God has provided us with a way to overcome that. And we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. But kind of to start off this evening... I want to make sure that we understand that our heart is our spiritual center. That's what the Bible is really talking about. When he talks about, when, when any of the verses we look at are talking about our heart tonight, it's talking about that part that is right at the center of who we are. It is that which defines us. If you look in Proverbs, the 23rd chapter, in verse 7, it says, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Now, a lot of people would say that, well, actually, it's the actions of a man that define him. And I wouldn't disagree with that too far, except to say what causes those actions to occur. And here we have an indication that it is, in fact, how you think in your heart that defines who you are. If you look a little further in Proverbs 27 and verse 19, Proverbs 27 and verse 19, it says, as water... As in water, face reflects face, so a man's heart reveals the man. In other words, just as if you go over to a pool of water and you kind of stare down in it and you see your face kind of coming right back to you, the psalmist says, or the Proverbs say, that's how your face is. Your heart reflects who you actually are. And that's what God is actually looking at. When God tries to measure us, when God looks at us and tries to decide what he thinks about us, he's looking at our heart. And I know this is true because we can look at that in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 16. Of course, this is a familiar story to most of you. This is when Samuel is trying to pick out who's going to be the next king of Israel. 
And he's looking at Jesse's children. And he's looking at one of them. He says, ah, that, that guy looks pretty good. And this guy over here, he looks pretty good. But notice what the Lord says to Samuel in verse 7. He, he's looking at one in particular, and, he, and, and his name's Eliab. And in verse 6, Samuel says, surely this is the Lord's anointed. Verse 7, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, for I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. See, when the Lord is looking at us, he's not necessarily tied up in how well-dressed we are. He's not tied up in how we look, what our appearance is, you know, how we conduct ourselves as we walk among people. He's looking at our heart. And he's trying to figure out what kind of heart does this person have? Because that's going to define our spiritual actions. Well, if that's true, then we need to understand that our heart needs protection and care. Because that's the thing that God's going to look at. That's the thing that God is going to measure us off of. And so what we want to do is we want to guard it. We want to keep it pure. And it really doesn't matter if you are the oldest person here tonight or if you're one of the really youngest people here tonight. We all have a responsibility to try to protect our heart and keep it as pure as we can. Every one of us has that responsibility given to us from God because our heart is really important. Take a look back over in Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23. It says, keep your heart or protect your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. We need to make sure that our heart is protected spiritually. In Psalm 3, or I'm sorry, in Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6, we're told to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. And of course, Jesus in Matthew 5, I think your notes may say Mark, but actually it's Matthew. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8 in the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus is, is delivering what we call the Beatitudes, he says, blessed are the pure in heart, because those are the people who are going to get to see God. So we have a responsibility to guard and protect our heart. And the reason we need to do this is because it's not just us out here in the world. There is actually an adversary who is trying to get to our heart, who is trying to corrupt our heart, and he's trying to defile our heart. And that adversary is Satan. Take a look with me at an example of this in Acts chapter 5. In Acts chapter 5, we've got a situation where the church has just started, and people from all over the place have stayed in Jerusalem because they've just become Christians, and they got no jobs, they got no place to live, they got no food. And so what happens? Well, people who do have some means are starting to sell their property and, and give the money to the apostles' feet, feet and, they're, and they're saying, hey, give these to the people who need it. Let's take care of these people. And that's a great thing. But then we run across a man named Ananias. And in chapter 5, he decides that he wants the payoff, he wants the praise and the glory of making it look like he's giving all this to help people out, but he wants to keep a little back for himself. And notice how the Bible talks about the situation in Acts chapter 5. Beginning in verse 1, it says, A certain man named Ananias with Sapphira's wife sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back a part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? After it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. See, I know that Satan is working against my heart because he worked against Ananias. He just whispered in his ear and said, you know what? You don't have to give it all. Just keep a little back. Make it look like you gave it all. Keep a little back. See, Satan's working to corrupt my heart. And he's working to corrupt your heart. So we have a responsibility to try to protect ourselves from those things. We need to guard our hearts. Secondly, we need to exercise our hearts. 
Now, we all know physically that when we talk about exercise, it's, you know, doing cardio and lifting weights and, you know, doing all these things to kind of get our heart rate up, and that's good for it, and it helps it. But what in the world do we do to exercise our heart spiritually? Well, I'm going to tell you a couple things. The first one I'm going to tell you is that we can love the Lord. In Mark chapter 12 and verse 30, Jesus is asked, what is the great commandment of the law? And he has no time. He doesn't say, let me have some time to think about this or let me consider it. But he goes right to the heart of the matter. And in verse 30, he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. We are told to love the Lord. Now, there are things that the Lord asks me to do that sometimes I'm not wild about, you know. The Lord asks me to do things that are hard sometimes. But you know what? I love the Lord, so I'm going to make the decision to do that thing. I'm going to decide that I'm going to love the Lord. Another thing that I can do with my heart is that I can purpose it. I can purpose it. You remember Daniel, back in Daniel chapter 1, Daniel is taken off into this foreign land. He is selected as one of the specially, you know, promising young men, and he's given the opportunity to, to serve on the king, and they're going to give him food that is the king's delicacies, the very best stuff that they have. But in Daniel chapter 1 and verse 8, the scripture says, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's delicacies. And as a result of that, he came up with a way that he would not violate the law of God through the things that he was being asked to do. He put a purpose to his heart. What I'm telling you about that is that you decide. No one told Daniel, you know what, you got a purpose in your heart to serve the Lord. Daniel already knew that. He already knew that the Lord was the most important thing. And so he set his heart to a purpose that he was not going to give in. You know what? You don't have to give in when you're tempted to look at your buddy's paper on a test. You don't have to give in when somebody wants to show you a dirty picture. You don't have to give in when someone wants to tell you a dirty joke or wants to gossip about somebody behind their back or wants to do any one of a hundred things that you know, if you stood back and looked at it, were wrong. What I'm saying is move that, stuff, move that thinking about the things that are wrong up front and purpose in your heart, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to participate. I'm not going to go to a party where I know that the only thing that's going to be going on is drinking. I'm just not. I'm making a purpose. Well, the third thing you can do with your heart to exercise it is you can believe. Look at Romans 10 and verse 10. Romans 10:10. 10, 10. And I'll go up to verse 9. It says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. You can give your heart the job to increase your belief, to grow in your belief. You can purpose it, you can exercise it, and you can grow in your belief. And all of those things will strengthen your heart will exercise it towards godliness and will give you an opportunity to be stronger for the Lord. Well, the third thing you can do is you can feed your heart the right stuff. Now, in the physical sense, people have asked me a couple of times, they've said, Doug, are, are you on a special diet now? They got you eating a special diet. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I've told people the same thing, really. What they've told me is, there's food that's good for your heart, you should eat that. And there's food that's bad for your heart, and you really shouldn't eat that. And that's the special diet that they gave me. And, you know, it's simple, but it ain't that easy when you've spent, you know, years and years of not doing that, right? Well, your, your spiritual heart is the same way. What is it that you're taking in? What is it that is coming into you to influence your heart? Are you letting... The culture around us influence you? Are you letting the thinking of the people around you 
influence how you think about things, or are you allowing yourself to be instructed by the Word of God? Take a look with me over in Psalms 19. Psalm 19 and verse 7, and verse, actually verse 7 and 8, Psalm 19, verse 7 and 8. It says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. These are the things that we should be putting into our heart. The word of God. We should be letting that inform us about how we're going to see the world and how we're going to process it. Take a look over in Psalm 119. Psalm 119. In the very early parts of this psalm, we get a lot of feedback about what we should be putting into our heart. Take a look at verse 2. It says, Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. Verse 7. I will praise you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. Verses 10 and 11. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's what we should be taking in to our heart. That is one way that we can guard, protect, and strengthen our heart and let it move in the right direction. Well, that's a nice healthy lesson. But I have to tell you a couple of things that I don't really want to talk about, but I need to, and that is that your heart can be damaged. Just like your physical heart can be damaged for a variety of reasons, your spiritual heart can be damaged. And the question that you might ask is, well, how do I know if I have damage? And there's a word we use for that. It's called symptoms. Symptoms just means I can see that something is wrong with you. And Sometimes those symptoms are pretty severe. You know, in the physical sense, someone who's having a heart attack, they might might feel like there's something sitting on top of their chest. They they have a hard time breathing. Their heart's racing. They, They have no power. All these things can happen severe, and you know something's wrong. Well, spiritually speaking, there are severe symptoms as well of damage to your heart. Take a look with me in Mark chapter 7. In Mark chapter 7, there's a little bit of a discussion that's going on about eating with unwashed hands and whether or not that defiles a man, whether that makes a man unclean. And Jesus wants to clear up something about, you know, physical and spiritual things. So if we take a look at beginning in verse 18, He's trying to clarify it to his disciples, and he says, Are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him, because it does not enter his heart but his stomach and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods? And he said, What comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All of these things come from within and defile a man. You remember when we started tonight, I said, you know, people look at the actions of a man and they say that that defines a man. And I said I didn't necessarily disagree with that. And this verse is why. Because Jesus says all of those evil actions, all of those things that we see people doing, start off in the heart. They are severe symptoms of a heart that is way damaged in the sight of God and needs to be fixed. And so when we talk about people who do all of those terrible things, all of that evil that we just listed, what we need to understand about it is that that's coming from a heart that's been damaged spiritually. We don't have to go that far. We can look over in Psalm chapter 10 and verse 3. Psalm 10 and verse 3, talking about a man who 
doesn't really respect the Lord. It says, for the wicked boasts of his heart's desire. He blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord. And of course, Psalm 14.1 says, the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. You know, when you get down to the point where you're saying there is no God, your heart is severely damaged spiritually. It is in need of some major repairs. So we understand that there are severe symptoms, evil actions that we have to see. But I'll tell you what, sometimes there are mild symptoms. And that's not as simple to see. In fact, one of the things I learned in, in, my, in my heart discussions with people is that, you know, a lot of times people have physical symptoms of, of heart problems, and they just ignore it and push through it until things get worse and worse and it's too late to help them. But mild symptoms can be recognized if you're paying attention. You say, well, Doug, what kind of mild symptoms are we talking about? Well, for example, I'm going to talk about being slow of heart. Take a look in Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. In Luke 24, the Lord has already been risen from the dead. And he meets up with two men who are walking to Emmaus, who are disciples. And they don't quite recognize who he is, and they tell him all about what's happened to Jesus. And they're really not sure what to make of it all. Notice what Jesus tells them. In, ver in verse 25, he says, Oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ have suffered these things to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So they were slow of heart. They were just slow to believe. It's not that they didn't believe. They're just slow. They need to get on board. They need to get on board a little faster. Jesus was a little frustrated with them and says, we need to move faster. Well, what about kind of delivering a little half-hearted service? Look at Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 8. Jesus here is quoting Isaiah. He says, These people draw near to me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. How's your worship service today? You feeling locked in? You feeling like you're worshiping the Lord? Are you bringing your best to the master? Are you doing it all the time? Has it been a while since you felt like you really were worshiping the Lord? That's a mild symptom. That's not something to be easy to see. Because you know what? I showed up. I was here. I was here Sunday morning and Sunday night. And I may show up on Wednesday. But what's going on in my heart? Is it half-hearted? Am I doing it just because I show up and I go through the motions? Or is my heart engaged in the way that it should be? You know, in the book of Malachi, the last book of the, the Old Testament, God has some complaints against his people. And they don't even realize what the problem is. Take a look at Malachi chapter 1, and I'll just read verses 6 through 8. This is the Lord speaking to his people. He says, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts? To you priests who despise my name, yet you say, In what way have we despised your name? You offer defiled food on my altar, but say, in what way have we defiled you? By saying, the Lord's table is contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord God of hosts? God knows when our worship is favorable, when it is acceptable, when we have put ourselves into it, and God knows when we've kind of gone through the motions. God knows when it's just kind of a weariness to come to services, but we got to do it because otherwise people will call me. Right? That's a symptom. That's a symptom 
that we might need to get something checked out. Well, what do we do with that? Well, maybe what we need is a heart exam. I really appreciate Dr. Clifford reading Psalm 139, 23 and 24. I'm going to read it again uh, because I think it's so important. Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Gee, you know, we're, we're instructed to seek out the Lord and have him check us out. So in verse 23, he says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We can ask God to help us out. Lord, have I got some mild symptoms I'm not seeing? Lord, am I not doing everything that you expect from me? Please show me. We can ask for that help. We can have that kind of a heart exam. You know, Matthew 6 and verse 21, Jesus says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Our treasure's in heaven, folks. That's where our heart needs to be. Our treasure's in heaven. And we need to make sure that we're asking God to help us understand if our heart is right with him. Well, finally, I think I want you to understand that, that even though you might have some symptoms, even though there might be some heart damage, your heart can be strengthened and your heart can be healed. And we're going to look at Matthew chapter 9, verses 12 and 13. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 12 and 13. There Jesus talking says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus came to address heart problems. Jesus came so that he could restore in us a heart that is pleasing to God, that he could give us that opportunity and that pathway. Take a look at Psalms 51. Psalm 51, verses 10 through 12. It says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. The Lord can create in us a clean heart. Look at James chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. James 4, 7, and 8. I'm almost there. It's after Hebrews. There we go. James 4, beginning in verse 7, it says, Therefore submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. You know, our Lord came and died on the cross as the perfect solution to heart problems. He sacrificed himself so that we could be healed and could be purified. And so the question that I have for you is how's your heart tonight? How's your heart? Maybe you've got some severe symptoms and we don't know. And I'm not going to tell you that that's okay. That's a bad thing and you need to do something about it. You need to get it square with the Lord. But maybe you've got some mild symptoms and I'm not going to say that's okay either. I'm not going to tell you to push through that. I'm going to tell you to get with the Lord on that and take care of it. Jesus died so that you can have a heart that is pleasing and acceptable to God. If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, that's the action you need to take. You need to become a child of God. That is what the Lord asks of you so that he can create in you a clean heart. Maybe you've been a Christian for a while. 
Maybe you've kind of wandered away. Maybe your service has been a little half-hearted. You know, you can make that right with the Lord tonight. And if you need us to pray with you and for you, we're open to doing that. But please don't leave here tonight with symptoms of a damaged heart and not do anything about it. Get your heart right in the sight of the Lord. Strengthen it, renew it, and put it to his service. And if we can help you with any of that, won't you come forward while we stand and sing?